Come on, just start talking. You're good at that. <clears throat> so, so my friend Abs on Twitter at losing control twenty three asked me to reflect on kind of the whole neo Christian movement going on right now. How exactly did they put it? Um, the Christ consciousness is spreading, but people don't understand what that strange feeling is. They see the prince appearing in the sand, but are unable to imagine what is carrying them. The sensation of meeting the inner redeemer and what that means. And, uh, boy, that's big. Uh, and I don't, it's like, ironically, maybe the most challenging angle that they could have asked that general a question from. Uh, which I guess I'll get to. But I've been just kind of mulling on this for a couple weeks now. And uh, I've written a few things and uh, thought a lot. But I haven't really... I don't feel like I've actually gotten to the heart of this. So I figured I'd just try talking into a camera for a bit and uh, seeing what happens. Uh... Christ consciousness. I guess we can start there. Mycelium mage, um, who's at? I can't remember for sure right now. I'll make sure to get it in somewhere. Oh, hi, Peaches. Um, Mycelium mage talked about. Christ having this kind of self-sovereignty, this self-assuredness, this embodied confidence, and that, uh, to them, is central to what Jesus came to give humanity. It's just like a pattern for feeling good in our bodies, not because of like cheap sinful pleasures but because of uh, <laughs> well because of Christianity in general whatever that even means right I'm supposed to be answering that question so Christ consciousness is, in a very real sense, the state of mind, the state of body, the state of soul and spirit that lets you feel that sense of embodied peace. So we're called to put on the mind of Christ. Uh, we're called to be, the, the, to the Latin term is alter Christus, other Christ. We are all, each of us, a kind of incarnation of Jesus. Like all of us. The temptation is to always want to think that it's, you know, either me or some person that I'm aligned with and by me I mean all of us but all of us have the power and the responsibility of being Jesus for each other and the world um, and what that mainly looks like is a bunch of humility actually um, but not a false self-deprecating humility, but just like an actual, full, wide open awareness of you, the world, what you are in it, of God, of your relationship to God. 
there is just something about Jesus, right? It's, he's such an interesting figure. Uh, I almost said character. I, I uh, we can maybe circle back around to why I feel uncomfortable about that. Uh, but he's such a compelling figure. It's really hard not to like Jesus, even if you don't believe that he was incarnate God, uh, like more directly, we are incarnate God through being him and being made in the image of God. Somehow he's even more, I don't know, like, I, I know a lot of fancy words to try and explain it, but I don't know. But, He's just so loving. He's loving and kind and he's obsessed with the song of Hannah in I think first Samuel, right? Because it's she's giving birth to Samuel. Yeah, yeah. Um it, it talks about God casting down the mighty from their thrones, lifting up the lowly, lifting the poor from the heap to set them amongst the nobles, which gets echoed in Psalm, what is that, 117? No, 16. And, uh, and then in the Magnificat, in Blessed Virgin Mary's uh, hymn, when she's hanging out with Elizabeth, while she's pregnant with Mary, or while she's pregnant with Jesus. Um, and then it gets, you know, it's, it's, it's a laser focus of, especially in the Gospel of Luke, of Jesus' ministry. He wants to upset the power structures of this world. But he wants to do it in this, like, infuriatingly, uh, I don't want to say passive, but it's, 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 and, and, and indirect isn't even exactly true either, but it defies our expectations, uh, the way that Jesus goes about resistance. Jesus is always going to have, a, the, the, there's a phrase, preferential option for the poor, for the oppressed, for the outcast. Jesus is always going to have a bit of extra... <sighs> People in power are held to account for their good use of that power and for their misuse of that power. Um, we all have power and we're all judged for misusing it, but like people who are at the top of the hierarchies that shape our society are held to even greater standard. And I find that compelling. I find his focus on love, forgiveness, humility, service. I, I just find it very... Some people think that he is very naive about human nature and I could not like, I, I, I guess I could see that, but to me, it's, it's in response to our worst and our best and how those are connected. Jesus knows all these things, like the, the things that he said that he tried to make sure got passed on. And of course, there's always that infuriating distance between us and actual historical Jesus. 
Uh, it's just some people that doesn't matter. It it does matter to me. I'll be I'll be honest. Uh, I don't need Jesus to be like historically real. It would be a pretty formidable challenge if I were ever presented with, like, undeniable proof that there just never was. I believe in him as an historical figure. I believe that he was crucified and that he rose from the dead in a physical body. That's a very important, like, historical fact for me. It's an important moment in the history of the cosmos, certainly for humanity. It represents a kind of, to me at least, an affirmation of human embodiment. Jesus could have risen as a spirit. Jesus could have not died. Jesus could have led an army of angels uh, to recapture Jerusalem. He walked with single-minded purpose, followed his narrow way, took him to the cross. He died. He rose again. And he didn't come back as a spirit. He didn't come back as, like, just, I'm God the Father now, again, what's up, you know? Uh, or, or, you know, I'm not God, I'm God the Word again now. No, he, he stayed human, and he stayed human in a human body. A body that's changed, something weird has happened to it. He can go through walls. Sometimes people don't recognize him. Other times he's clear as day. He eats. It's one of the weirdest things. When he appears to the disciples in Galilee and he's like, y'all got anything to eat? And they hand him a fish. And he cooks it up and eats it. Like, <laughs> what do you do with that except go, oh, clearly... Being a body, doing these things like sleeping, eating, stretching, walking, or, you know, movement of any kind. And I think that's one of the things that the Christian tradition has lost the most, uh, especially in places really heavily influenced by uh, American Puritanism. Sorry about that, rest of the world. Uh, yeah, it's like most people do not, when they think like, focus on embodiment, they don't think Christianity, like... But to, to, to me, it's such an obvious piece at the heart of the whole, the entirety of scriptures. And I mean, there is actually some understanding of this in the tradition. Uh, it's just that a lot of it has been like laser focused on sexual purity, which That's, that's a, that's a lot to get into. So I think we're at a moment where if we're recognizing more and more the need for embodiment in the face of spending more and more time kind of disembodied into our devices. And so I don't think that this little 
buried treasure is going to stay buried much longer. Um, I'm definitely not the first person to notice uh, N.T. Wright comes to mind. Honestly, N.T. Wright is probably the biggest, like, that's what got me started on the whole train. Uh, his understanding of the resurrection and uh, in, like, fairly orthodox to Western Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism in you know, I don't want to say every bit of particulars, but this is like generally the like orthodox view. You you die, right? Like whenever you die, your soul leaves your body. Your body, whatever happens to it, happens to it. You could throw it into the sun, even like God will find a way to get it back. Don't worry, God's good at that. Your soul goes to be with Jesus is the phrase that shows up. It never talks about going up into heaven. That's where Jesus is. But your soul's up there. And then at some point in the future, Jesus comes again. The coming of the Messiah. Uh, and there is judgment. Uh, just really kind of a laying bare of the facts of everything that happened during time uh, <laughs> and seeing it through God's eyes, seeing what's right and just in God's eyes. But in that judgment, there is... <sighs> And honestly, I'm not super. I'd need to go look up to see exactly when. If it happens, if everybody's standing there embodied during the judgment, or if after everybody's been judged and we're all just floating their spirits, and then either way, in game, God's going to raise all of the bodies back. He's going to, like, even if... Like, if you were a martyr and your body got burned and thrown into a river, you know, that's why I made the sun to, like, that's an actual case, the thrown into the river. Like, God will get your body back. Like, don't don't you worry about it. Um, so, and then that's where the world, like, new heavens, new earth, new creation uh, New Jerusalem descending from the sky. Uh, it's what it talks about in the book of Revelations. Um, so yeah, like I said, N.T. Wright, uh, was that surprised by hope, I think? Uh, was It's still, it's a good starting spot for kind of getting beyond the, what is, again, uh, largely American Protestant idea of, you know, like rapture, and heaven as a place that we go to and that's the end game uh you know q talking heads nothing ever happens and you know we can talk at great length about the church's like particular implementation and understanding of sexual purity but I think the general point that sex is something important and significant, uh, that it can be beautiful and holy, and that it can also wreck your shit, uh, I think that that's A, true, and B, it further points to this centrality of embodiment. There's the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox and lots of Anglicans and Lutherans and Episcopalians uh, insistence that when we do our weekly, often daily actually, altar worship, uh, we offer up an offering of bread and wine and in the middle of that ritual somewhere the Western, the Catholics are much more confident that they know exactly when that is than the Eastern Orthodox do. Um, somewhere in the middle of that ritual, the bread and the wine become Jesus' body and blood. 
not like on an external appearance level, but in a way that's more than symbolic. Um, and so deep mystery. Uh, often an uncomfortable one central to my faith. We don't really have any other way to actually physically touch Jesus. And even this, it's like, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not actually what it's like, but it's like Jesus has anamorphed. <laughs> into bread and wine across the space-time continuum. Uh, like, very specifically, in my mind at least, it's Easter Sunday, Jesus, every single time. It's like, just from that moment, he emanates into the rituals of remembrance of their various kinds throughout the traditions that Jesus mandated for us. But to kind of bring it back to this idea of they see these footprints, but they don't know who's carrying them. I guess part of what tripped me up about this question so hard is that like Jesus didn't leave even a single footprint not like literal, historical, super satisfactory to your Western materialist conception of the world. Footprints or fingerprints. He didn't leave any writings of his own. Um, we almost certainly have a lot of his actual, like what he said. Assuming that he was, I'm gonna, you know. Uh, but every single collection of his sayings that we have is filtered through some specific lens with a specific viewpoint, a specific author, a specific intention, and a specific audience in mind. And I do think that a ton of who Jesus really is, what he's really about, shows through. But it is deeply frustrating at times to be faced with the just total absence of any first hand you know we've got Paul's letters probably written about 50 AD Jesus probably died around like 28 33 AD somewhere in there I'd usually say later push it towards the later end of that range uh, and the gospel of Mark was the first of the four gospels to get written down um, earliest probably like 60 AD maybe like 58 and uh, latest probably around like 75 uh, so well after the events uh, and then Matthew and Luke are written later, and John written, like, maybe 180, maybe even a little later, even. So, we don't have, like, we don't even know for sure. We just kind of assume and fill in this blank of, oh, there must have been an oral tradition from the apostles, from Jesus, from... You know, all of the people who saw him in the crowds, they were, you know, he mostly ministered to Jewish people who have a very, like, deeply culturally embedded system for orally passing on traditions. So basically anybody who ever, ever saw Jesus, even just like, you know, oh yeah, I was at the Sermon on the Plains, you know, that's still, they could pass on these stories and so you have this milieu 
and for, you know, at least 20, 30 years, nobody wrote any of it down. Uh, in part because they were pretty poor, in part because they had a good oral tradition, especially the, you know, the Christians in and around Judea. Um, so when you have all of those accounts out there, and you have the accounts of his inner circle, uh, whether you believe that that's the traditional 12, there certainly do appear to have been, you know, at least four, five, six, seven, eight. Like, I don't see why there couldn't be 12. I'm just, you know, I keep an open mind on that kind of thing. These people would have also been passing on their knowledge. Uh, when people were starting to write these collections down, maybe some of the authors consulted uh, with these witnesses, but certainly they would know that they could be checked against them. Uh, and maybe this didn't matter as much if your gospel was intended for an audience well away from uh, Jerusalem, but, you know, one of the other interesting sort of historically embodied teachings to come out of Christianity is that Good news travels fast. <laughs> like the 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 history of the tradition itself is part of that embodiment ethos for me. The way that it went from apocalyptic that's what i was thinking earlier it's apocalyptic they, 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 part of the reason why nobody wrote anything down is because the first generation thought he was coming right back he didn't he didn't come right back it's been quite a long time now um and like i don't think it's possible that he's coming back uh there are certainly still things about teleologically focused, you know, spiral instead of just a circle. That, that, that appeals to me still, I can't lie. But I also recognize a bit of like, Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett, when he was trying to escape, it's a, there's a movie. First off, I'm talking about a saint. There's a movie. It's great. You should go watch it. Uh, even if you aren't like a Christian nerd, it's just a good movie. Uh, so Thomas Beckett, he grows up with the king and their friends, but he becomes a bishop because the king needs an inside man. But he starts becoming like actually legit like oh i guess i gotta take this god stuff seriously huh and king never expected that gets pissed thomas flees to a monastery and in the movie uh there is this great line about how it's just it seems too easy right it seems too simple and uncomplicated to just live out the rest of his life being a monk, turning his back on all of the problems that he's running away from back home in England and with the king and all that. Uh, like somebody needs to stand up to him, in his mind at least. Uh, and this, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it feels like cheating to him. And I think that kind of to think that we can, of our own human merits, just manifest a new creation that's holy and perfect and sinless is hubris and foolishness. But I think that sitting 
and waiting for Jesus to come and fix everything while we continue to just, you know, let the world become a shittier and shittier place. That seems too easy. So <laughs> I've tended to lean more towards focusing on the apocalypse happens every day. The unveiling happens every day. The world ends somewhere every single minute somebody's world comes crashing down. This is a universe of equal parts, beauty and cruelty. C.S. Lewis talks a lot about how one's capacity for goodness and one's capacity for evil are kind of matched. So if you aren't very capable of much evil, well, you know, cool, there's a lot of harm you won't do, but then you won't be very capable of much good. So you won't help much. Um, and if you're very capable of great goodness, awesome. But that means that you're going to have to be even more careful because the badness that you can get up to when you're used to being good is just increased. And you're going to be held more responsible because... <clears throat> for lots of reasons. <laughs>